ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات ربي وسلامه عليه عباد الله يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون وقال تعالى يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء فاتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا وقال تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد our praises due to Allah we seek his guidance and his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and the whispering of our desires whom Allah guides no one can misguide and whom he allows to be misled no one can guide and i bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah alone having no partners and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his slave and his messenger and his perfect worshiper as to proceed Hatim ibn Balta'a was a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Medina who became aware that the Prophet وسلم, was preparing the army to proceed to Mecca for the great conquest. And Hatib wrote a letter to communicate to his family that was in Mecca about the arrival of the army. And this is a very dangerous act. In fact, it's an act of treason that you're giving the enemy information. And so Jibreel came and told the Prophet ﷺ of the letter. The Prophet ﷺ then sent Ali ibn Abi Talib and Zubair ibn al-Awwam to go and intercept the letter. And they left Medina. Hatib had sent the letter with a woman. And when they caught up to the woman, they asked her, or they demanded rather, the letter. The woman said, what letter? I don't have a letter. And they said, eventually, after she kept denying the letter, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he said, listen, we're not lying, and we definitely haven't been lied to. And so you're going to hand over the letter, or we're going to find it on you. And so the lady pulled out the letter from her braids, and it was then taken back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Prophet وسلم, called Hatib ibn Balta'a and he said, Oh Hatib, ma hamalaka ala hadha? What caused you to do this? What caused you com- to commit this act? And Umar ibn Khattab anhu, said, Oh Messenger of Allah, he's got no excuse. Just allow me to take care of this guy. Hatib said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I did not do this out of disbelief in Allah and His Messenger. But my family has no protection in Mecca. And so I wanted them to at least be prepared. I wanted them to be aware so that they could make their considerations. Everyone else has family. Everyone else has tribes. Everyone else has protection. But how's my family going to be okay? And so when Umar who responded with what he responded to, the Prophet وسلم, told Umar, he said, Oh Umar, you do not know. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala glanced at the people of Badr. And Hatr was one of the people who participated in the battle of Badr. And said, ma shi'tum faqad ghafartu lakum. Do whatever you wish, the people of Badr. I have forgiven you. That the people of Badr, their standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so great. That act of worship, that participation, that it absorbs whatever they, mistakes they made for the rest of their life. But Hatr radiallahu anhu in that moment, had made an apology to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He had provided his excuse. And so today, I wanted to speak quickly and briefly about this notion of apologizing. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he says, in a very profound hadith, he says, مَنْ كَانَتْ عِنْدَهُ مَظْلَمَةٌ لِأَخِيهِ مِنْ عِرْضِهِ أَوْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَلْيَتَحَلَّلْهُ مِنْهُ الْآنِ Whoever has an offense that he has committed against his brother, whether it is in their honor, their dignity, or in anything else, then let them seek to resolve it now. He says, let them do it today 
before tomorrow where there is going to be no currency other than good deeds. On the day of judgment, everybody will come to collect from everybody who's harmed them, everyone who's offended to them. And the only currency that will exist on the day of judgment is deeds. And so Rasulullah is telling us that whoever has an issue, whoever has committed an offense against their brother or sister, resolve it now. Resolve it now. At some point, we became an ummah that doesn't apologize. At some point, parents don't apologize to their children, spouses don't apologize to each other, bosses don't apologize to their employees, and leaders of communities or even nations don't apologize to their flock. And we have to be people who take responsibility in ourselves. It's easy to complain about you know, how people disregard their responsibilities over in the Muslim world, their lack of responsibility, it being distant and dismissive, but who will take responsibility for the cause that we cause in our circles of influence, in our personal lives? The negligence that we have for each other or the lack of trustworthiness that we have for each other. It starts with us. It always starts with us. Every verse of the Qur'an was revealed for you. Every single verse of the Qur'an was revealed for me, individually, before it being revealed to anyone else. And so when we're talking about this notion of apologizing, the first is that when I commit a mistake, well the first is to believe that I commit mistakes. There's none of us who is perfect. You see people who walk around with t-shirts that say, to save time, let's just assume that I'm always right. And some people actually carry themselves like they believe that they're always right. They're never wrong. You've known that person for 25 years, 30 years. They might be your spouse or your sibling, or, and they have never ever been wrong. But the Prophet وسلم, he says, Kullu bani Adam khatta, The Prophet وسلم, tells us that every son of Adam is a sinner. Everybody makes mistakes. And the best of those who make mistakes are those who repent. And so the reality is, is that nobody's perfect. And as much as we may like to perceive it, we make mistakes. But the best of those who make mistakes are those who when they make mistakes, they're able to acknowledge their mistakes. And when it comes to the context of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they repent to Allah. And when it comes to the context of individuals, that they're able to rectify it with those individuals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to himself, he says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Allah says when it comes to himself, great news, amazing news. Allah says, never despair from the mercy of Allah. Those who have wronged themselves, never despair from the mercy of Allah. Verily, Allah forgives all sins. Every sin that you and I have ever committed or will ever commit, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of forgiving it. As long as you approach him, as long as you repent to him, as long as you commit to resolving your affair, making yourself better, as long as you fulfill the pillars of repentance that are known. But why is apologizing so difficult? Why is apologizing so difficult? At the core, at the core is a truth that we don't want to face. And it's mentioned that there are two types of people who have a really difficult time with apology. Number one is the one who feels self-pride, the one who feels false pride. It's when you think more of yourself than you are. The universe revolves around you. Anything good that happens is because of you. And anything that happens that's bad is not because of you. It can't be because of you. How when you're so amazing? That false pride. But the second, and this is actually very telling, interesting, shocking even, that person who never apologizes, and you assume that it's false pride, it could actually be because of self-doubt. Self-doubt. That person who thinks less of themselves than they are. Because then, that, your emphasis is on protecting yourself. Your self-worth becomes attached to people's validation, and so when I assume responsibility, or when I say that I'm wrong, or when I acknowledge that I have made a mistake, then I have acknowledged imperfection. And that imperfection makes me uncomfortable because it then becomes a chink in my armor. It becomes something that I feel people might think of me as less than. But if my self of, 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 of validation is independent of how people think, then I would be comfortable saying, or I would be more comfortable saying, I, I fell short, I'm a human being. 
My value is not attached to this particular mistake. My self-worth is not attached to how someone may perceive me, no matter how they may perceive me because of this. And so an apology, at, you know, it, begins with, it begins with surrender and it ends with integrity, that integrity of self. The danger of waiting to apologize, of course, is that the longer a person waits to apologize, the sooner their, their weakness is perceived as actual wickedness. We all make mistakes and we all fall short of perfection, but what can make us seem evil in the eyes of others is the belief that if we can't be truthful about this incident, if I'm obviously wrong and I can't admit it, then I might lie about other things also. I, I can't have the ability to actually trust your version of events. I can't trust your statements. But too many people, apologizing is perceived as weakness rather than as strength. What is honesty? Honesty is telling the truth to ourselves and others. And integrity is living that truth. Living that truth. That comfort. You see with the Sahaba, their, their willingness, even in the heat of a moment. Famously, Abu Bakr and Umar got into a dispute. And Umar leaves and he goes into his house, feels bad. And so he goes to find Abu Bakr. He goes to Abu Bakr's house. Abu Bakr isn't there. Abu Bakr is with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But Umar had went to apologize to Abu Bakr. He had went to apologize. And then when he goes, he finds Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam even more angry at Umar just because he had offended Abu Bakr. Even though Abu Bakr was the one, Abu Bakr said, I was the one who made the mistake. But that notion of trying to resolve issues. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that our actions are lifted on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They are lifted except for two people who have a conflict between them. And it is said, re relieve these two. Leave these two until they reconcile. But that reconciliation has to start somewhere. That reconciliation has to start somewhere. Now, of course, does that mean that every apology, but also part of that is, is, is accepting apologies as well. Accepting apologies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, let them forgive and overlook. Do you not wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overlook your faults as well? And so part of it is not just learning as far as developing a culture of apology. is not just learning to apologize, but learning to accept people's apology. Of course, the question that comes with that all the time, because Allah says, let them forgive and overlook. Do you not wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you? The question that comes with that is, does that mean that I have to accept people's apologies even when they've... I'm not sure whether they actually mean it, even though they may be insincere, even though they are always relapsing, even though, even though, even though. The Prophet Sallallahu he says that the believer isn't bit from the same hole twice. And the Prophet Sallallahu showed us some apologies that aren't accepted. Abu Azza was a man from the Mushrikeen who participated in the Battle of Badr against the Prophet Sallallahu and he was captured. And the Prophet Sallallahu gave him general amnesty, he freed him, he doesn't need to ransom himself, nothing. It's free ago, on the condition that he does not fight against the Prophet ﷺ again. Guess what? After the Battle of Uhud, there's Abu Azza, again in the enemy camp. And this time he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, leave me for my children, my family. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to let you twist your mustache in Mecca saying, Khada'atu Muhammad Murratain, that I I tricked Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam twice. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the second time didn't accept it and he said the believer is not stung from the same hole twice. That does not mean that I don't forgive individuals when they harm me, but that I don't put them in the same position to be able to harm me again. I learn from my mistakes. Forgiveness is one thing. Love and accommodation and closeness and proximity and access and all of these things is something different. أقول ما سمعت مستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه غلوف الرحيم And you see that a lot in the seat of the Prophet ﷺ. Umar ibn Khattab, when he met the killer of his brother Zayd, and Umar loved Zayd very much, and this man had accepted Islam after he had killed Zayd. He said, Umar said to him, I ask you by Allah, and Umar is the Khalifa, he said, did you kill my brother Zayd? And the man said, yes. And then Umar who said, then stay away from me, because I'm never going to love you as long as the earth uh, doesn't love blood. We're never going to mix. And so the man said, Oh, Amir al Mu'minin, is your lack of love for me going to stop me from receiving my rights as a Muslim? He said, No, your rights are one thing, and my love for you is something different. And 
He said, okay, that's fine. The Prophet وسلم, accepted the Islam of Wahshi, but he told him, he said, can you just stay away from me? Because he had killed his uncle Hamza. That forgiveness can be independent of, again, all of that love. The only one who loves perfectly after sins is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how great the sin. And that's why that pairing is so beautiful when Allah says, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودِ he is the forgiving and he is the loving. Meaning no matter what a person does, Allah may forgive them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may love them perfectly. Finally, what are some things that can be done as far as languages of apology? Languages of apology. Number one, of course, the, the greatest act is repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Repentance that's done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest form of apology. But number two, with regards to others, human beings, that you begin with those who are closest to your family, those that are, um, those who are, you are most intimate with, there will always be more need for apology too. Because those are the ones who you interact with in the most deep and passionate level. Your family, relative, neighbors, people who've wronged, settle your business, before you settle it with them on the Day of Judgment. And when you look in the languages of apology, of them is, for example, compensation. Imam Malik had a young man come to him named Hisham ibn Ammar. And this man's father had sold his house to come and study with Imam Malik. And this, unfortunately, this young man just didn't have any sort of manners at all. He didn't understand any of the protocol of Imam Malik's halaqa. So, this guy comes, he's so excited. Imam Malik says to him, okay, you read and I'll correct you if there's any problems. And he says, no, you read. He says to Imam Malik, he says, you read. Imam Malik says, no, that's not how it goes around here. You read. And he says, no, no, you read. Imam Malik says, you read. He says, no, no, you read. So Imam Malik says, you know what? Go have this guy taught. And so he was taken and he was lashed. He starts to cry. Imam Malik says, you're seeking hadith and you cry? And he said, I'm not crying because of the, the discipline. I'm, I'm crying because my father sold his house to teach me hadith. And I haven't learned hadith. I've just gotten disciplined. And so Imam Malik said, OK, then let me resolve this for you. Forgive me. And he says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to. Until for every lash, you teach me a hadith, for every lash that I receive. And so Imam Malik narrated to him, privately, to this, to, re, to, to, to compensate him, right? So figuring out how to resolve with individuals. And then the Hisham, he said, if this is what I get for lashes, then give me more lashes so I can get more hadith. But the point here is the compensation with others. And for, for, for many, it is a change in behavior, that apology be communicated by change in behavior. And that's one of the pillars of Tawbah as well that you can say you're sorry as much as you want, but that you show that you're sorry by changing the behavior that caused the apology in the first place. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to hear the speech and follow the best of it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us our, our actions, to forgive us our sins, and to forgive us our shortcomings, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us actions that will lead us to paradise from speech and from actions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the best of our days, our last days, and the best of our moments the day that we meet him. Allahumma inna nas'aluka jannah ma qarrab ilayha min qadri wa'amal. Wa na'udhu bika minna naru ma qarrab ilayha min qadri wa'amal. Allahumma ati nfusina taqwaha, zakiha anta khiru man zakaha, anta waliuha wa maulaha. اللهم ارحمك بأهلنا المستضعفين المكوبين في كل مكان اللهم ارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين واشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا صلى الله عليه سيدنا محمد وقوم إلى صلاتك الحمد لله